I'm Julian Rogers, and this is On Point. Our guest is Arthur Nibbs, responsible for agriculture, lands, fisheries, and Barbuda affairs. He joins us on point. Welcome, sir. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with the agricultural portfolio because obviously this is a very critical time. We've got drought in both both territories, for instance. What impact is that having on our food production? Well, obviously, you know, without water, one cannot do anything great in agriculture. Antigua itself, um, you know, or, or historically, when you speak of Antigua, it was Antigua against water, meaning that we didn't have much water. And it's the still the same situation. So that is one of the greatest challenges that we have in agriculture because, you know, food production would require a lot on water. One will have to tap into irrigation services, which we are not so great on at the moment. We do have a small portion of irrigation at Diamonds Estate, and you can actually see the production if we just would get some more. So it's our intention now to, to speak with our development partners, uh, the Chinese for that matter. I think within a week or so, they'll be coming in to, to look at our agriculture and to see what they could do to assist us with our production, particularly at Diamonds. Tell me, how different is the situation between Antigua and Barbuda as far as water is concerned? Well, the difference with Barbuda is we still have a drought. At least we receive less rainfall on an annual basis than Antigua. But what's good for us, we have a lot of groundwater. So just with some treatment and, and so on, we'll, we'll be better off. So there's not um, the lack of it. It's just a matter that the quality is not up to date. But that can be done with just treating it and then you're ready to go. Let's talk about food crops and the production of. In Antigua, what is the focus? Well, right now we're trying, eh? I must say trying, because you have a little bit of everything everywhere. But since I took the ministry, I've decided to work with the technicians. We need to kind of narrow that down and to have, uh, for instance, we're thinking of being self-sufficient in sweet potatoes, onions, and, and carrots, and, and, and pumpkins. That, that's what we're trying to work on now as the major crops, which means that when we, when we reach to our optimum um, level, we would not have to import any of these commodities here. And then the, the regular small farmers can be involved with, the, you know, other vegetables and so on, sweet pepper, hot pepper, and that sort of thing. But Barbuda has always been targeted as a place where there's a possibility of very high level of crop production. What's the situation? Well, uh, mainly it's the root crops, you know. O over the years, it's been like the yam, the sweet potato, cassava to some extent, and we're always great on our peas and beans. And I don't know, know if you, you've heard of our history of the peanut. That has been allowed to disappear. So right now as we speak, we are doing some research to actually reintroduce the, the, the peanut into Barbuda because we, we had a great history of, of growing the biggest peanuts in the region. Now, if we talk about crop production, you talk about getting up to a particular optimum level is there a possibility that we could get to a point where we can export? Well, that is always on the cards, but one would like to be self-sufficient first, reduce our foreign exchange and so on, bring foreign exchange, that is, and to reduce the amount of things that we import into the country. That is the first focus. Then obviously now we'll try to go out and do some exportation as time goes on. You are on record as being critical of the extension services in the ag agriculture sector. What have you done to repair that? Well, it's still not yet fixed because just on my way here, uh, I've seen uh, at least two other farmers who are having some challenges and it's always having to do with the extension. I think the extension officers need to get a, a, a firmer understanding as to their role. Their role, they're like the educators. That's how I see it and that's how it's supposed to be. They're supposed to be out there, you know, meeting with the farmers, giving them advice, whether it's on how to apply pesticides, fertilizers, etc., etc. And that, they don't seem to be that synergy. The farmers are complaining that they're not seeing the extension officers enough. And I've decided that we're going to pull them all together. It has not happened yet. I've been seeing them one on one, and then the intention is to get all the extension officers in one place so we can get a greater understanding of their roles. As you talk about farmers' complaints, what are they telling you besides complaining about the extension services? 
Well, of course, it's always the, the price of water is too high. Uh, access to land, and there are times when they cannot get access to uh, good agricultural land, and also roads. There have been all sorts of problems with the feeder roads. And I intend to, to, to see what we can do with that in the coming year, not this year. But in, in 2016, we're going to look at that matter of the access to the farm. You talk about land, availability of land. A lot of land is going into housing these days. What are the possibilities of providing more land for farmers? Well, that's the, that's the balance we'll have to try to, to strike, Julian. Because as you know, our government has an initiative to, to improve and expand on our housing stock. Uh, we started with 500 homes and now we're aiming at 2,000 homes. And that really would cause a sort of competition because we're having a challenge um, having to, as it were, give up lands that were traditionally used for agriculture and to try put some into housing. One just have to strike that balance, you know. How are you also living up to the responsibility of providing land for youth? What has happened in, that, in terms of that campaign promise? Well, right now, we're going to term that as like not just the land, housing for the youth. So rather than just selling the land to the youth, we're going to let them have a house and land. And it's also going to be part of the overall housing initiative. We have not lost sight of that. We, like I said, we're going to now add the house to it so a young person can, can come and buy a home, a property which includes the land and the house. You say buy. What kind of facility you expect will be set up? to make that possible? Well, you know, lands, you'll have to purchase the land. It's not like in Bob, the way you might have to get a lease here. You have an opportunity to, to own the land here on mainland Antigua, which is a good thing. Uh, so what, we, what we'll be doing is the government itself is trying to, as it were, have an injection of capital into this project so that we can bring the, the prices down so that they'll be more affordable to the young people in particular. Is that mechanism in place or is it something in the works? It's in the works. Not yet fine-tuned. Uh, it's all going to be coming through the national housing um, Any timetable? Not yet. Not yet. Too soon? Well, I, I would not have all the details. The Minister of Housing would, would be more on top of that. As you talk about land, I can't help but ask you this question about land as far as the comparison between acquisition of land in Barbuda mm -hmm. as opposed to land in Antigua. Is it fair to say that it is an unfair situation where Antiguans are not allowed to buy land in Barbuda, but Barbudans can buy land in Antigua? I don't think you should use the word unfair. It's just a matter of two different systems. I've been to Dominica myself, been a Barbudan and heard of the, the Caribs there. I went to the Carib territory myself, and they enjoy a different land tenure than on mainland Dominica. And I don't hear anybody saying it's unfair. Uh, and it's not unfair because I, I, I was at the London conference in 1980 when the father of the nation, V.C. Bird, was the leader of that delegation. And what V.C. Bird told us in the special caucus that we had in Lancaster House in 1980 is that provided the Barbuda Council can guarantee that there would be no discrimination against Antiguans having the access to use of land on Barbuda, he had no problems with the current uh, land system that exists. And Antiguans can have access to lands in Barbuda by a long rent or a lease. And what you should understand, Julia, not even the Barbudans are allowed to purchase land because of the system. I would have loved to perhaps have a tight lead that I can own my property individually, but the system does not allow that. So for the Antiguan to say it's unfair, what about the Barbudan who is from there, born there, and still can't own it? But then you need to clarify. If you can have a lease arrangement in Barbuda, can you take that to the bank? Yes, yes. The investors have, have utilized a, a long lease on Barbuda. It must be a long lease because you cannot easily well put any kind of sizable development with, say, a 25-year lease. One will have to negotiate for a 99-year lease, which will give them enough time to recoup uh, on their investment and, and make a decent profit. But you're talking of major development. What I want to clarify here has to do with an ordinary Barbudan or Antiguan, mm -hmm. in this case, acquiring a lease of property in Barbuda. 
Well, there will have to be some groundwork, Julian, because you realize one will have to have discussions with the financial institutions and set up the necessary instrument that, that would allow you to utilize that lease as a collateral uh, instrument. It would not be automatic that a Barbudian would expect to get a lease and then walk into a, a bank downtown and, 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 and get the, the So you're the saying security. that a Barbudian right now still has to get a lease, a long-term lease, to be able to use that as collateral of the bank? That is correct. That is correct. That is correct. So how then have Barbudans been able to build houses, as I've seen them, mm -hmm. over the years? My friend, very difficult. You do that right from your pocket, right from the start. And traditionally, you, you'd have a, a kind of a help within the community. For instance, at the foundation level, people just get to, together, you cook up some food, some drinks, and they'll come and work for you uh, free. So you assist yourself and, and cut down the cost that way. It has been difficult, Julian, because I can tell you, there are people who have been forced to move into uh, the property that is not yet complete. Uh, a lot of people say, look, I will have to get some enjoyment out of this stuff before I move on. So you might be inside, the, your, your walls are not yet plastered, etc., etc. It has been difficult, but it would take a, a good bit of education being put out to the people for them to understand the benefits that can be derived from having the fee simple situation. You're watching On Point with Julian Rogers, still to come. What are you doing to ensure, for instance, that the offshore islands are truly protected? And as you think about that, is the Yida project a threat? One man, one night. Watch traditional TV catch up with the web. Comment in real time as you watch. Viewers' reactions are part of the conversation. Hot topics, challenging issues, Hashtag social conversation. Hashtag watch what happens live. Monday Night Live, more than just talk, only on ABS. Keep in score, Thursdays at 8.30 p.m. Welcome each morning with a smile. Every new day is a special gift. Receive your blessings through inspiring words, uplifting music, and awe-inspiring imagery. Morning Inspiration, a clean alternative program for people of faith. Weekdays at 6 a.m. on ABS. You're watching On Point with Julian Rogers. Let me then turn my attention to another critical area as far as your portfolio is concerned, and that has to do with fisheries. Mm -hmm. Now, on Antigua is one thing, on Barbuda is another. Mm -hmm. It would seem to be that there, there are these critical differences. Let's deal then, first of all, with the fishing, the marine resources of Antigua and Barbuda. Do we know what we have? Are we in a position to protect what we have? And what are the biggest challenges to meeting the mandate, so to speak, in this portfolio? When it comes to fisheries, there's an overall legislation that governs both islands. Uh, the, the Fisheries Act, it, it takes in Antigua and Barbuda. But the council also has some residual rights over what you call is the near shore fishery within Barbuda. I think it's stretched to about three miles out from, from the shore. The council has the right to, to police that. Uh, so with respect to knowing what we have, uh, it is difficult to say exactly, um, Julian. So that is one of the key tasks that we must perform going forward, is to get an inventory of really the marine stocks. Uh, uh, we, we're going to need assistance in that for sure. But the Japanese government have already indicated their willingness to assist. Because what you find is that the nearshore fishery has been um, exhausted, more or less. Because everybody is going out there, going after the nearshore fishery, and it is actually creating a problem. So what we need to do now, Julian, is what to, to go out in the, the pelagics. This is where you get the marlin, the wahoo, the, 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 the bigger fish that will, will fetch you better price even. 
So, so I'm intending to go to Japan later on next month. Uh, we've started some bilateral discussions already with the view of the Japanese government assisting us with some bigger boats that we can go out into the Pelagics. Also, built in into that arrangement would be training so that we can train our fishers to utilize the various equipment and so on that will go along with that situation. So we will have trawlers of our own in our own waters? That's what you're saying? That is the plan. That is the plan. To have fully equipped, modernly equipped uh, fishing boats. I noticed you said trawler, but I would prefer to say fishing vessels because that <laughs> intention of the trawler is to get things as big as Barbuda and that will kind of clean out everything in a short moment of time. Because once you're, you're, you're interested in harvesting, you would not like to deplete um, the resource uh, entirely. But other people are using trawlers in our waters. It's illegal, but uh, our ability to monitor that is just not up to scratch. Uh, the same very people that may be exploiting our, our, our marine resources, those are the same people at times that we are forced to go to to ask for assistance. Are you referring to the Japanese? To some extent, and then um, the people from Guadeloupe. Just recently, uh, there, there was some confrontation or, uh, within our waters with Japan, um, fishermen Guadeloupe. from Guadeloupe actually threatening the local fishers here, and, and that is uh, really a situation. What representation uh, have you been able to make to the, to the French authorities? Well, the Attorney General has been on to that, and uh, he assured me that within the next couple of days, he'll be speaking with the French authorities to sign an iron out. Because once we want to protect our resources, we still want to have a good working relationship with our neighbors. And quite recently, um, we've been getting very close to, to, to the people from Guadeloupe, our Minister of Trade, he led a, a trade exposition to Guadeloupe earlier in the year, and we're expecting to have the Guadeloupians come in here too. So you have to tread on these grounds very cautiously. I understand the Chinese are interested in coming into our waters and fishing. Well, I have no direct knowledge of that uh, at this point in time. None whatsoever? No. The fisher folk are saying they understand the Chinese are coming. Well, they were here actually buying lobster and, and so on sometime early in the year. But I think um, that those people have gone, gone out of the country. So I'm not aware that the Chinese are trying to get into the fisheries. As you talk about lobster and people coming to buy, what is the situation in terms of managing, one, the fishing of lobster, so to speak, mm -hmm. and the sale locally as opposed to experts? Well, legislation, again, you have to go the way of legislation. We have regulations on, on the size. Uh, you, you know, a lobster have to be over about a pound and a half before one is allowed to catch it or for either local consumption or export. And quite recently, we've introduced a season uh, for about two months e each year when you can't take the lobster at all. And what, what, what the, the, the technicians have done, they've looked at the situation and, and, and then pick out a, a time in which, you know, we're having the, the lobsters kind of having the eggs and so on. So those are the times you don't take them. But there is some confusion as regards that new season experiment. The suggestion is that it is the wrong time. I wonder when is going to be the right time. We try to strike a balance. We look at the, the, the hotel season and also the time when the, the lobsters are reproduced. And, uh, and, and uh, if you're going to err, you want to err on the side of having the reproduction process being continued. So there are some fishers who would like you to change, and there are others who say it's good. So, but it's not cast in concrete. What we do from time to time, we'll have consultation with the fisher folk, and you would change accordingly. But always bearing in mind the reproductive process of, of the species that you're trying to protect. Talk about protection. There's some concern that we, are, we, we haven't moved against things like chub fishing. We still haven't moved against net fishing, etc. These are practices that are really destroying the very industry that the fishermen are, are, are depending on. How are you dealing with those kinds of matters? Well, Bob, you is taking the lead on that. And I don't know if you've heard of the Blue Halo Initiative. We have teamed up with a, a, a great gentleman who've made his wealth in the United States by probably selling computer parts, such as a guy called Ted Waite. And he, he has an institution called the Waite Foundation. And we have, we have teamed up with them. And he, his special interest is to look at the health uh, of the ocean. And you spoke about the chubfish. 
we already have um, uh, bylaws in place, just a matter of the date of implementation, where we'll outlaw altogether the harvesting of the chub. Because the chub is like a lawnmower. You know when you use a lawnmower to cut your grass and so on, keep the lawn intact? That's what the chub fish will do on the reef, to eat the algae growth and so on and keep it down so that our reefs can be healthy. Because the reef produces food for the same fish. So we are going to outlaw the chub uh, in Barbuda and we've had discussion with the fisheries here and they too are going to come on board so that we'll outlaw it between both islands uh, in the situation. Reef, net fishing also, we're going to curtail the use of nets, especially around the reefs too. Because the, the Dominicans were, uh, were specialists in that. They have long, long, long uh, nets that they'll come and they go right around the reef and they, they attack the chub fish. We are going to outlaw that too under the Blue Halo initiative. Now, you talk about the Blue Halo. It has not always been welcomed, particularly in Barbuda, because fishermen there feel that it is a threat to their basic livelihood. Well, we intend to still go through because right down the road, and this is driven by science now, it's no guesswork. We've brought scientists from America and other places to come there, and they've done all the necessary research and the groundwork. The fishermen in Barbuda, they're in support of this because uh, I've had documents. Not, not all of them. Well, you never get it all. You never have everybody um, agreeing to everything. He may, you, they may see us as uh, curtailing the way they, they would make a living, but in fact, we're ensuring that they'll have it going into the future foreseeable future because if you keep taking and taking and taking Julian and never think about regulating it's gonna run out so they're gonna see the fruits because like I tell you, it's driven by science and in the lagoon in particular well the lagoon what, what we're doing with the lagoon we're putting a, a ban on the lagoon for a number of years because the lagoon have been seen to be like a natural hatchery the lobster the fish they'll come in and after they reach certain size they make their way back out into the ocean so what we have done with that now we have kind of divide the lagoon in sections you have no fishing zone you have areas where you used for transport because there's where you'd use to ferry boats over into the, um, the bird sanctuary etc so that's what we're doing we're making the various sections for different activity. As you talk about the marine resources now, I want to ask you what is happening, say, in the North Sound area. I mean, this is, this is a pristine area. Everybody is very conscious about preserving this for, more, one, for more, one, more reasons than one. What are you doing to ensure, for instance, that the offshore islands are truly protected? And as you think about that, is the Yida project a threat? Yes and no, uh, uh, because the mangroves, as you realize, do pro provide a lot of protection and also food for uh, marine life. And, and there may have to be some uh, destruction, uh, uh, for, for want of a good word, to, to mangroves uh, in that area. But what we're, what I, as the Minister of Fisheries, and, uh, and we've had an, an understanding at cabinet level, that whatever, de whatever development is going to take place in those areas will have a close collaboration between the fisheries and the developers. In other words, we'll look at what has been proposed and we'll also give advice to them and just make sure we strike that delicate balance. Can you confirm, for instance, that there's been an environmental impact study as far as this YIDA project is concerned? Truly, I have heard of one, but I cannot confirm that there was one. I've heard that there was a, an environmental impact study done for that whole area, even before the Yida group came into existence. And you plan to follow up on that? Definitely. On what needs to be improved or updated, it will be done. Because the last thing we would want is to have all these various hotel properties built in, and then at the end of the day, there's no marine life. Because a lot of people leave North America and elsewhere come here because they know of the fresh fish and whatever we have. And it would be a terrible thing if we were to destroy that. You're watching On Point with Julian Rogers, still to come. Barbuda Council, you've got a problem with that. You're down to three days a week. Yes. You talk about this being a short-term situation. Hopefully. But was this situation worsened by your hiring more people in the Barbuda Council since you came to power. What political party would come out of an election 
and then you don't create one employment. Week in Review, Sundays at 7.30 p.m. Welcome each morning with a smile. Every new day is a special gift. Receive your blessings through inspiring words, uplifting music, and awe-inspiring imagery. Morning Inspiration, a clean alternative program for people of faith. Weekdays at 6 a.m. on ABS. You're watching On Point with Julian Rogers. Let me come to the land now, and this time particularly to focus on the parks and those environmental areas that come under your portfolio. What have you done since you've taken over this portfolio to enhance the park operations? Honestly, we have not um, done any work in that area. There are existing legislation on the books uh, that govern parks. Uh, at the top of my mind right now, I can bring that over to you but there are legislation in place that would preserve and protect what goes on in, inside of those, those legislation areas. apart I'll give you one example mm -hmm. park rangers mm -hmm. are you aware that they should be park rangers or that there's an operation like that I'm aware that provisions are made for park rangers sea wardens uh, different um, people would assist with the regulation in these parks, the commissioners, you, you name it. There are, there are those things put in place. It appears that you haven't had a lot of no, work haven't had in a that, lot of time in that particular area. Up. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Let's then turn to another aspect of, of, this, of, this, of this portfolio. And I want to focus on, on Barbuda specifically here. Mm -hmm. You, for a long time, served in the Barbuda Council. That's correct. At a time when government in power in St. John's mm -hmm. was not of the same political stripe as what was in Barbuda. That's correct. You're now in a situation where you are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Is there a change? Yes. Uh, right now, well, as I sit here, I'm, I'm in the, the, the seat of the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Fisheries and Barbuda Affairs. I'm a Barbudan. Um, the elected parliamentary representative for Barbuda, but yet still I head up a, a ministry w within the state. So that is a big difference. Uh, say prior to 1980, it was just a, such an antagonistic atmosphere where the Barbuda Council was always at constant loggerhead with the central government. And I think that, has, uh, that also uh, uh, accounted for the lack of development on the island. Because you do need to have both government, local and central working together for the good of the island. And I would say since we've made that change, you're beginning to see marked improvement. We're spending more money, the government is more, you know, connected, the council and the government working together. And I think that's a recipe for progress going forward. You say you're spending more money, yet there are people in Barbuda who are working three days a week under the council's regime. Mm -hmm. Well, that has just happened uh, recently. Uh, but the, the situation of government and council working together, it has been since um, 2014 
when my predecessor, the Honorable Walker, he also enjoyed a position within the cabinet and also being um, the member for Barbuda. And you have seen some improvement, for instance, roads, concrete roads coming under Mr. Walker. Uh, uh, the, the, the thought of a, 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 a dock and these kind of situations. Well, this, this three days now, Julian, is having to do with the cash flow problem within the country right now. It's not just Barbuda. Uh, we have decided to take this bold move because one has to be responsible. The, the, there have been a reduction on, on, on the amount of money that is coming from the central government. So naturally, we are just tailoring uh, the payroll to suit. And it would not be indefinitely. We're hoping that by December, the latest, when the revenues start to roll in, the hotel season is going, the CIP revenue, we'll be in a better position to go back to full week. But people are getting $190 an average a week. And the cost of living in Barbados is very high mm. because of the import of most of the things you require. How are people surviving? They are surviving. Barbudans are very resilient. And, uh, and this is also going to uh, allow the young people to, to get a taste of what used to happen. A Barbudan never get himself into one thing. If you, you're not working with the government, you go on fishing, you go on hunting. There's so many other things you can do to sort of you know supplement your your low income but like i said we have no joy in this and we're not expecting this to be for any long length of time i am very optimistic the latest by january we should be back to full employment full employment from the barbuda council or a combination of council and the tourist resorts on the island council and the com combination of the resorts because i am very hopeful that come december when this case is heard that we would be triumphant and the Robert De Niro James Packer project which is uh, estimated to spend 250 million US dollars that is going to turn the economic fortune of the island around that project would be able to create employment for all Barbudans who want to be employed and also Antigua and that is the vision that we have coming out of this project it would seem to me Mr. Nibs that every time there is a resort project in Barbuda it is hailed as the next salvation. Yet, over the years, none of these projects have come to fruition. Why? Change. Barbudans will have to get accustomed to, 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 to the idea of change. Because look at it, Julian. We have had this system of land tenure for all our life, right? And then when you look back at the economic development of the island, I want to be frank with you. There's no Barbudan who can point to any particular situation that they've benefited by having this land tenure. You can't point to me to say, look, I've schooled three, four of my children because of the land system. You can't show me that, look, you've, you've made businessmen and women because of the land tenure. You need to change that. Because over here on the mainland, Antigua, I've gone to school at grammar school. And when I look around all my peers, they're businessmen. It's not because I, I don't have the, 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 the capacity, but they have been able to utilize the title deed of their grandmother or their parent and, and attract monies from financial institutions and set themselves up. So Barbudans need to change. The system of, of the ownership of the land, in my estimation, has been resolved. We now have a land act that was passed in 2007, putting all the lands in the hands of the people, and for any development of land to take place, you'll have to get the people's consent and the council. So the fear of, for instance, Antiguans or the government coming to take the land away is not there. So we need now to change and to have that land working for us. You didn't say that when I asked you earlier about the difference between the acquisition and, and ownership and leasing of land between Antiguans and Barbudans. Have you taken that position to the people? That position, you see, someone will have to take that bold step. Why not you? Well, it could well be, but it's just a matter of time. You see, timing is of essence when one comes to politics. Eh? And I learned this from the emeritus leader, the Honorable Lester Bird. You can do the right thing at the wrong time and the results would not come out good. Uh, how about the right thing at the right time? That would be ideal. That would be the ideal situation. So timing is of essence. And you have to strike that right time to take that message to the people of Barbuda. And I think that the young people are going to see that. 
but you must be very frustrated at the fact that you've been in the Barbuda Council for so many years, you're now a government minister, you now point to the potential of this resort project, which you say once the, the judicial process clears right, it, right. will get underway. But what about the other resort developments in Barbuda? What do you mean by the other resorts development? What other resort developments can Barbudans expect? Well, Barbuda lends itself to tourism development. We have the most beautiful beaches in the world. Princess Diana came there about four times before she died at the K Club in Barbuda. And you've been there, I'm quite sure, when you went on that beach at Low Bay, you, you were swept away. So, 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 so the, the situation is there. Uh, but it's just to get the people to understand, like I said earlier. And I am optimistic. I am very, very optimistic. In, and I have a lot of confidence in the young people in particular that they're going to assist me in changing things around. Mr. Nibs, it appears that most developers want to have a huge quantum of land to, as some people say, speculate with it to be able to make a success of that. Uh, if we take this one that is now before the courts, for instance, they've asked for a sizable amount of land, but the insistence is, why don't you take the first 200 plus acres and get on the way with that? You see, large quantum of land, this project um, that will be done by Dinero and James Packer, they're only asking for 140 acres additional. The, cu the current... Additional um, to? To 251. Yes. That they purchased that lease out from the, the owner, so that there's no dispute there. That's, their, that's theirs, they've purchased that. But for the type of development that they purchase. want... You purchase a lease, yes. not purchase a land, you purchase a one, lease. Want to make sure that we yes, understand yeah, sure. ourselves here. I will get myself killed for that too. Yes. It's the purchase of the lease because one cannot buy land in Barbuda uh, at this point in time. You can have long leases. So the additional land is just 140 acres. And the people have shown to the council and to the people the, 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 the land use plan. And I don't see that with any sort of speculation. Why would you think that Robert De Niro or James Packer would come to Barbuda to speculate? They're coming with their own resources to do this project. And, uh, and one has to have a plan. You can't have a little small hotel without the necessary amenities and so on and expect to make big money. So these people, are, they have a master plan. But if forced, because I've had um, discussions with uh, Mr. De Niro, uh, if, for instance, that we're going to have a long, drawn-out court battle, I've, been, I've managed to convince them that we will do whatever we can on the existing 251 acres. And perhaps uh, as we go along now, people will grow to understand the need for the additional land. But I, for one, and the majority of the people are convinced that an additional 140 acres would not hurt Barbudans. But what is the land doing now? You have feral, you just roaming of animals, defecating, urinating all over, not bringing any returns to the people of Barbuda. So why not lease it? And what you're doing with the lease, you're just giving a group of investors an opportunity to develop your land, to, to create employment, generate much needed capital and income to take care of the goods and services of the people of Barbuda. What is the land doing now? It's just laying there. So I, I don't see any problem with the lease. And we're very fortunate. Because a lot of other investors, they would want to purchase the land. But just take it. People are coming in to spend 250 million US and all they're taking is a long-term lease. I think we should run with that. Barbuda Council, the whole matter of trying to raise the payroll, for instance. Mm -hmm. You've got a problem with that. You're down to three days a week. Yes. You talk about this being a short-term situation. Hopefully. But was this situation worsened by your hiring more people in the Barbuda Council since you came to power? I know a lot of people would like to cast the blame on Barbuda. What political party would come out of an election and then you don't create one employment? Not even the opponent will expect that. That is what they would have liked to happen so that they could go out and criticize. It is natural. You've been on the hustlings, you've been campaigning. You must be able to create jobs for the people. But and if it, you don't have money to pay them... It's not a matter don't have money. If we were allowed to carry through our plan, because everything was carved out and planned, this project would have been on stream if we did not have the very people who, who, who are blaming us 
for doing this or not doing that. If you had allowed that project to, to continue, they would have absorbed at least 50% of the workforce from the council. So you're admitting that you added people to the payroll? Of course! I make no apologies and I'll do it again. How many people? Well, we've raised it, the, the dollar value now. I may not be able to give you the bodies, but we have raised it by a mere $20,000 US. And what was the period? It was one sixty-five. then we brought it to about one eighty. not even twenty, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 more. Could you do that without the approval, say, of the central government? Because they're providing budgetary support. But of course, the council has its own budget. We approve our own budget, and we have the power to hire and to fire. Even if you don't have the money to pay the people? Every government has that power. You think the government right now have all the resources that they would want to have? But, Mr. Nibs, it would, would, would appear to be irresponsible to be able to hire people and not know that you can pay them. I knew that we would have been able to pay them if we were allowed to carry our plans through. Because the plan was to attract foreign direct investment so they can take some of that strain from the council but all and the council would, re would, would now concentrate on infrastructure and health and things of that nature. But all of that takes time, Mr. Nibs. Mm -hmm. You could not have had instant injection of funds from that project. I am saying to you, Arthur Nibs will do it again. There's no way I would go through an election and can't create one job. And if we were allowed to have our way, we would not have been having this, this situation but here now. I'm only questioning the timetable. You made a commitment. Well, the timing was right. This is fresh out of the election. People were, were looking for relief. There are lots of there are people. You have to understand the politics, you know. There are one set of people that were getting what we call the gravy. So now we have a change of government. You're telling me now that I should not create jobs for the people who assist us to, to take the government? I will do it again. But you're creating jobs and giving people three days a week. No, this is not then. This is now. This is because of the economic situation within the country. We don't push all the buttons. We, the government inherited... Um, the go the government was almost bankrupt. We're just like cleaning up. You see, the thing was much worse off than we thought when we inherited the government. But if it was much worse than you thought when you inherited the government, how could you realistically go and offer people more jobs? Because the, the, it was there on the cards. You could see the progress that we would have made in a short time. We would have made in a short time. Yes, one what, 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 just what, did what not have a short time. The direct foreign investment would have been on the cars. We had enough project proposals on the cars that within six months or so, you would have the people going out there to work. But now, the same opponents, they blocked them. But now you have a, you have a major shortfall. Yeah, and we're going to get out of that. I'm very optimistic. With all the hard work that the government is doing, Trust me, by next year, God's willing, early, you're going to see the projects rolling out. You're watching On Point with Julian Rogers, still to come. On the aviation side, we've got a brand new terminal in Antigua. What's happening in Barbuda? For Barbuda, cabinet has approved that we will establish what you call Barbuda Airwaves. One man, one night. Watch traditional TV catch up with the web. Comment in real time as you watch. Viewers' reactions are part of the conversation. Hot topics. Challenging issues. Hashtag social conversation. Hashtag watch what happens live. Monday Night Live. More than just talk. Only on ABS. Welcome each morning with a smile. Every new day is a special gift. Receive your blessings through inspiring words, uplifting music, 
and awe-inspiring imagery. Morning Inspiration, a clean alternative program for people of faith. Weekdays at 6 a.m. on ABS. You're watching On Point with Julian Rogers. So let's then go to the Citizenship by Investment Program Barbuda style. How different is that from the one in Antigua? Well, not much of a difference. We're going under the same um, layout. Yeah, same layout. Only that the people would not be able to purchase the land. They would be given long-term leases. How is that going? What have you been able We've to do so far? We've had a major setback. Because one of the, the, the very first investors that we, we have attracted to come part of this CIP arrangement was an investor out of Dominica. Uh, he owned the uh, Jungle Bay Resort. It was one of the most leading ecotourism resorts within the region. And that was totally devastated in, in, in the hurricane that passed in Dominica. So that's a, a bit of setback there for us. Because he would have been the first investor to go in there and build... Uh, 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 and a resort that would be called Mystic Bay. You have the Jungle Bay in Dominique and Mystic Bay in Barbuda. We'll twin them. And then from that now, that would have attracted the other investors to kind of buy in. Because it would be more difficult to, 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 to sell uh, empty lots. So the idea was to get um, Sam Raphael from Dominique to build the Mystic Bay there. And then these other people come in. Because he would have his wellness center, yoga center, you name it. That was, I've been there to Jungle Bay myself in Dominica and uh, we loved it. So that is why we have decided to bring it to Barbuda. So we have a bit set back and then now there's a jostle between the Dominican government and us. They are trying to convince him to, to, to rebuild the, 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 the Jungle Bay before coming to Barbuda. So that's a big toss up now between the investor. Let's look at some of the infrastructure challenges of Barbuda. The dock, for instance, the river dock. There's a claim that that dock area is not being cleared of sand in a consistent way and therefore boats are not able to go into the river dock like they used to in the old days. Well, that is not entirely correct because the traffic has returned to normal now. The boats that come there are not really large boats. There is need for some improvement going into the future, for instance, when this major development is going to come on stream. And Mr. De Niro has already given a commitment that he would do whatever improvements needs to be done at the dock so that they could land all the containers, etc., everything right there in, in Barbuda. So, and I think even right now with about 400,000 US dollars, we can improve the existing dock to, to a, a real workable solution that can um, take care of the needs of the people of Barbuda. Related to that, there were two things on the campaign trail. One was to make Barbuda a port of entry. Two, to create a duty-free facility. What has happened there? One, the, 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 uh, the port of entry has been approved. Our cabinet has approved that. We are just now, again, because of the cash flow, the logistical arrangements to put in, like, you know, your warehousing, etc., etc. That is yet to be done. There is a special cabinet committee put together, uh, including the Barbuda representative. And as soon as the dust settled, we'll be delivering on, on that port of entry very very soon two duty free duty free that 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 is not in the advanced stages yet that was just an idea and a thought because we've looked at the saint martin model and the prime minister is very supportive of our if not the whole island to actually have a, a part of barbuda being declared as duty free on the aviation side we've got a brand new terminal in antigua what's happening in barbuda for Barbuda, cabinet has approved that we will establish what you call Barbuda Airwaves because there's always been some problem with commuting between the islands. So we've had the decision of the cabinet to purchase our own airplane. We're going to be twinning with Caribbean helicopters because, you know, it's not such of a viable situation for governments to be running an airline. So we would be purchasing an airplane, join up with Caribbean helicopters, and we're creating Barbuda Airways. Actually... Uh, uh, we've looked at uh, an Islander, but I was not satisfied with the age of that airplane. It was manufactured some way back there. So I've told the Prime Minister, no way, we want a brand new aircraft. So we're going to improve on the allocation and to spend 
about a million dollars and, and purchase a brand new. So an Islander is a is a very small aircraft. It's nine seater. Nine seater. Well, well, you have to take your time because we've done our, our homework. Uh, if you were to use even the 19-seater, which is what most people would have loved. The Trilander. Yeah, the, 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 the Twin Otter, you call it. Twin Otter. Yeah. It, you would not have the, 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 the load moving forward. And you just don't want to create an airline for style. So the nine-seater would do. And as you gradually get the development increasing and so on, the traffic, more traffic and Tegan's going to Bob Uder and so on, moving some more. Is the intention now to go up to a much larger? Is there a demand by the the resort developers, for instance, for an improvement in the air traffic between the two islands? There will be because uh, just just Coco Point alone running at times is a challenge because you're bringing people are coming in from North America and elsewhere at different times who would not necessarily be able to suit the. The, the, the current traffic, just one plane in the morning, one in the afternoon. So there is going to be a greater demand for more air services as we move forward and develop in the island. And also the investors, they are not opposed to actually assisting to build a larger a airport so that you can have um, like small jets. Because we are promoting Bob, you know, as five-star destination. So you're going to have people coming with their own executive jets and so on. They should be able to have their own hangar facilities there. So that's the plan that we have going forward. And a terminal? Yes, improved terminal and improved runway altogether. That would take private jets. What kind of timetable are we talking about here? I mean, these, these are just talks? These are Not just talks. We, when we get the clearance for this Robert De Niro project, because we've spoken to them already, and they've seen the need for improved uh, facilities. So that's also a part of the pro project proposal, a joint venture between the government and the investors to, to, to build a brand new airport, much bigger airport that can take the jets and so on. So we're looking on, uh, I expect to see these things happen in my first five years, because I'm going to be there for 15 Let's stay with the transportation. The ferry, I understand the ferry is grounded. Yeah, Bobby the Express, the, the boat I don't think is really durable enough for, the, for, for that run. It, it seems as though those were like river boats. Beautiful one is a very calm day, but we, we tend to get some rough seas between there, you know. So they have been, they've been having some serious challenges and being the only ferry running six days a week and so on. They, they often have maintenance problems, etc., etc. Uh, but I, I think um, I've heard from the, the owner and uh, within the next couple of weeks they should be up and running. But right now we are looking for other persons to come in, private sector that is, to actually have more ferry service between Antigua and Barbuda. Might you partner with Montserrat operators? That was, uh, that was there before, but something went wrong because the Norwegian government uh, pledged some money for that ferry that was purchased for Antigua Barbie de Monstrat, but something went wrong with that. I am not at liberty to say that right now. Uh, there was a bank loan in place, and you know, uh, lots of things went wrong with that ferry. I think it was called the Cosington Arrow, or Arrow from Monstrat, Cosington Barbie, you know, because it was there for both islands. And but something went wrong, Julian, with that. Let me then bring you back to a common area in terms of the services of your ministry. I want to look at the whole matter of the operation of the Development Control Authority. Over the years, there have been a number of criticisms about the operation of that, management, chairmanship, etc. What have we been able to do to reduce those instances? There have been changes. There's a, a new board, a new chairman in place. We still have not yet confirmed um, the director, Mr. Southwell. Is still, he's still in an acting position. But there are a number of reasons for that, which I'm not at liberty to say at this moment in time. But in my estimation, there have been a lot of turnaround uh, inside the DCA. Uh, only thing I'm kind of concerned about, every day my desk is just flooded with these top orders and notices going out to tell people to quit. It seems as though people are not conforming with the regulations. People are building without permission or they're building solid docks when there should be jetties that will allow water to flow through, etc. So um, and people need to, con to work along with the technicians some more. But they, they are doing their work. But like I said, the population need to work along with us. Is it that that offices need, need more clout of some sort? Mm. 
Yes and no. Yes and no. Because we've, um, from Mr. Southwell, he had made certain recommendations for certain technical people and we've um, furnished him with it. So, you know, we've tried our best to, to, to work along with them uh, as much as possible. But I think it has a lot to do with the commitment of the people and the people working along with the DCA. And then, you know, things would be lovely for all of us. The related survey office? They are calling for more space. Uh, which we would um, be dealing with shortly. They have received uh, a number of new pieces of equipment since I got there as the minister. There were warrants sitting down there in the treasury for months and months and months, and we've managed to, to kind of get things going. So Mr. Bird there is a chief surveyor. He's a much more happier man. Now he's calling for more space now for his mapping staff. Because, you know, we have the mappings where we have the whole Antigua on, on the map, you know. So when you want a plot of land, Julian, you could stay right there in your office and just pull it up to see whether it's vacant or whether it's occupied, whether it's crown or private. And he's calling for some more space now for his mapping staff. And the lands office? The, well, the lands officer, chief lands officer, he also uh, mentioning some challenges. But, you know... <laughs> Well, much what, more work needs to be are, done. What there. are those challenges? He's calling for more staff. And you know, right now, the uh, funds are tight. That's, that's the reality of the situation. That's the reality of the situation, um, Julian. Funds are tight. But like I said, I, we're very optimistic that come next year, a lot of these things will, will be tackled. The Chemistry and Food Technology Division, what is happening there? We are providing the required services, uh, you know, in, in terms of testing and so on out there at, at that lab. The Japanese, once again, uh, have come to our, our assistance. So we will be extending the lab facilities there so that we could offer more services. Dr. Linray Christian would be in a more position to give you the specifics uh, within a short time. When we have received all those, I'll be able to, to give you a clearer picture. On that particular situation. I understand the police are also using the facilities. Yes, yeah, so we're like for drugs, yeah, and also for drug testing. We offer those services um, to the police department as well. And been doing fairly well. There's been no complaints with respect. All right. The agro the agro industries, the whole the whole area of trying to create a lot more value added, for instance, to the to the produce that we're we we're, we're growing here in Antigua and Barbuda. Honestly, we are very low on that. We have a bit of agro-processing more from the private sector point of view. You have people doing jams and jellies. You have the, the hot pepper, Susie's, etc., etc. But much more needs to be done. And I think the focus going forward will be on that because we'll have to work with our development partners like FAO, etc., etc. Because our budget is a, is a bit small, so a lot of these work we're going to be teaming up with, with our development partners to, to go some more into agro-processing. I have heard complaints that government has never done enough to push agro-processing. For some reason, I agree with that. I don't know what was the real reason or reasons. We have not been concentrating a lot on, on agro-processing, and it's the way to go. And a complaint like that has come from somebody like Susie's. Well, she must be commended for the great work that she has been doing. But she has argued that the government has never, ever given her the support that she deserves. Mm. She wants factory space, etc., cetera, and, and, and overall support. I mean, can she count on this government to do things like that, not just for her, but for others as well? Yeah, others. I just, right now, to mind, we have just passed in cabinet the other day, the leasing of one of those old, long-time government buildings, to, to, I can't remember this lady's name, must be up better as a side. Mm -hmm. So we are making moves to, towards that situation. So I, I think we'll be more concentrating on that, Julian, in the coming year. Finally, World Food Day is coming up. What are the plans? Well, that is right on the cards, Julian. Uh, my director of agriculture will be, will, will be in a better position to speak to that. I have not yet been briefed. But you can, you can rest assured that the Ministry of Agriculture will be doing all in, in our power to ensure that Antigua and Barbuda will have a good showing on World Food Day. Thank you, Minister. Thanks to Minister Arthur Nibbs for joining us here on Point to look at his portfolios of agriculture, lands, fisheries, and Barbuda affairs. In the next edition, we'll welcome Michael Brown, the Minister of Education, Science and Technology. 
Be sure to join us for On Point here on ABS Television. I'm Julian Rogers.